Last month, Ken Paxton, the current attorney general of Texas, published a non-binding opinion that parents who provide their transgender kids with science-based medical care should be investigated for child abuse. This was quickly followed by Greg Abbott, the current governor of Texas, publishing a directive to the Department of Family and Protective Services to do just that. That department immediately placed one of their own employees on administrative leave pending an investigation into that employee for helping their own 16-year-old child through gender-affirming care. The department demanded that the family turn over the teen's medical records. The family refused and has enlisted the help of the ACLU of Texas and Lambda Legal, who have filed a lawsuit to block the records request and challenge the legitimacy of Abbott's order. This is all obviously a gigantic clusterfuck that puts trans kids and their families at serious risk. So I just wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about what's going on um, and go over a few things that I think might be confusing people uh, because it was even confusing me at first. First of all, what is the gender affirming care that is suddenly considered child abuse in Texas? Well, uh, Abbott's directive to DFPS lists the following. Reassignment surgeries that can cause sterilization, mastectomies, removals of otherwise healthy body parts, and administration of puberty-blocking drugs or superphysiologic doses of testosterone or estrogen. Let's take those things in order. Surgeries do sound like a big deal. Uh, Maybe we should restrict teenagers from getting elective surgery that might be difficult or maybe even impossible to reverse later, right? Well, it turns out we already do that. Uh, Current medical guidelines, by and large, suggest that teens wait until they're 18, aka legal adults, to have procedures done like genital or chest surgeries. Usually, this happens after they've been on hormones for years. Rarely, teens as young as 16 have been evaluated and found to be of sure enough mind to have surgery. So we can dismiss that as something that doesn't really happen. Abbott also mentions puberty blockers, though, and that does tend to be prescribed for teenagers under the age of 18, still under the care of their parents. So what are those, and why do people like Greg Abbott think that they're abusive to give to teenagers? Puberty blockers do essentially what it says on the tin. They press the pause button on the flood of hormones that we get when we enter puberty. They are completely reversible in that once you decide that you want to start puberty, you simply stop taking the puberty blockers and boom, your body knows what to do, your hormones leap into action. Most puberty blockers are a gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GNRH, delivered into the body via usually monthly injections or through an implant in the arm, like this one uh, that I have in my own arm that prevents me from getting pregnant. It's pretty cool. That's right. I'm a cyborg, and it's fucking awesome. Anyway, puberty blockers have been around for decades, and they're used to treat a variety of problems, including cancers that are affected by sex hormones, so like prostate cancer, for instance. Some kids experience puberty way earlier than normal, which can cause a variety of issues. So they take puberty blockers, usually until they're closer to 10 or 11. Then they stop, and then they have a totally normal puberty. For trans kids, Puberty blockers can be a godsend, or a science send, I suppose. You can probably imagine that if you fervently think that you are, say, a girl, um, things might get really upsetting when you start getting random erections and sprouting heavy facial hair. Hell, I find it upsetting when I sprout heavy facial hair, and I'm not even trans. It's not fun. Teens can start puberty blockers anytime after puberty begins, usually 12 or so at the earliest. They help by giving a teenager time, uh, time to consider what they truly want or time to get ready for what's coming down the road. 
Once the teenager is older, current recommendations are 16, but exceptions have been made for as young as 14. Uh, if it's a particularly mature teenager, they can decide to go off the blockers and then either experience puberty as the sex that they were assigned at birth, some choose to do that, or start taking hormones to essentially experience puberty as the opposite sex. After a year or more on those hormones, they can then decide, so around the age of 18, if they would like to proceed with surgeries. So why do people like Abbott consider puberty blockers to be child abuse if a teen can go off of them at any time and then experience puberty as normal? Well, this was kind of tough for me to nail down for the main reason that puberty blockers are overwhelmingly safe with little to no known negative side effects. But opponents claim a few things about puberty blockers. The things I saw most often, number one, that they're irreversible, uh, which is untrue. As I mentioned, they are easily reversible. And two, that they may cause a loss of bone density and possibly sterility later in life. When I was looking into these claims, uh, I saw things like that mentioned even in places like the Mayo Clinic's website, where they say that blockers might cause these things. That's not good enough for me. So after reading far more research on this than honestly I would like, um, it appears to me that the medical consensus is that none of that is true. Puberty blockers do not cause loss of bone density or sterility. A systematic review of the literature by authors designated by multiple pediatric endocrinology societies from around the globe found adverse effects of GnRHA therapy are rare, and the associations of most reported adverse events with the GnRHA molecule itself are unclear. Decades of experience have shown that GnRHA treatment is both safe and efficacious. Further, they say, there is no substantiated evidence that GnRHA treatment impairs reproductive function or reduces fertility. And in regards to bone density, while GnRHA treatment slows mineral accrual, after discontinuation, BMD appears not to be significantly different from that of their peers by late adolescence. Reports of BMD among children and adolescents verified a decrement in BMD at the achievement of near AH while accrual resumed after therapy, regardless of whether or not calcium supplementation was given. By late adolescence, all subjects had BMD within the normal range. So in other words, once they stopped the treatment, their bone density density returned to normal. Now, that was done on kids who had experienced puberty early, uh, who had more bone density prior to treatment. So this was really getting them in line with their peers. Uh, if anything, then bone density is just something that a trans teen would have to uh, watch along with their doctor and if they're having trouble, they can either switch to a different puberty blocker or take medication to improve their bone density. But there's really not a lot of evidence to suggest that it is in any way a problem. We know all of this because we have decades of research on puberty blockers. This isn't a new fad for trans teens. Um, we have the evidence not just in trans kids, but with precocious puberty, which is the medical term uh, for early puberty, um, which makes it sound cuter than it is. Puberty blockers are safe, easily accessible, and easily stopped, and the body naturally reverses them when you stop. So to recap, the more or less ideal timeline would go something like this. You're a child who feels gender dysphoria prior to puberty, and your parent supports you with an environment that's friendly and non-judgmental. Wear the clothes you like, cut your hair how you want, use whatever name and pronouns that you fancy. When puberty hits, around 10 or 11, let's say, you discuss the possibility of puberty blockers with your doctor. You can go through puberty or you can delay its onset while you think more about who you are and who you want to be. You take the puberty blockers, let's say, uh, for a few years, and at 16, you decide, you know what? Yes, 
you would like to transition to the opposite sex. You discuss it with your parents and with your doctor, and then you begin taking hormones, uh, which hormones depend on which sex you are transitioning to. You begin growing body hair and muscles or breasts, uh, you know, et cetera. And after a year or two on hormones, you get a better idea for how you now feel in this new body. So then you can decide one of three paths. You can detransition back to the sex that you were assigned at birth, which will require different hormone treatments. Uh, Or you could continue taking the hormones that you've been on indefinitely. Or you can decide to undergo surgery. You are now 18, and if you'd like, you can make these decisions without your parents' consent because you are now an adult. None of what I described is child abuse. What could be considered child abuse is uh, the ideal situation as imagined by people like Greg Abbott. Your thoughts about how you feel in your own body are suppressed throughout your childhood, and when puberty arrives, it's terrifying and painful and confusing. You suddenly think about killing yourself at twice the rate of your peers. You have a 40% chance of following through with that thought. There's a reason doctors refer to the use of puberty blockers in trans youth as literally life-saving. A large-scale survey conducted last December found that gender-affirming care for trans and non-binary teens resulted in a significant drop in depression, suicidal thoughts, and suicide attempts. And then another big study that I only saw literally right before I went to film this, um, it was published last week, it found exactly the same thing. Gender-affirming medical interventions were associated with lower odds of depression and suicidality over 12 months. These data add to existing evidence suggesting that gender-affirming care may be associated with improved well-being among TNB youths over a short period, which is important given mental health disparities experienced by this population, particularly the high levels of self-harm and suicide. The science on this is crystal clear. The rational guidelines doctors have set up to treat kids with gender dysphoria are working. They aren't just safe, they're necessary to save lives. They're saving and improving the lives of trans kids. As we've seen with other issues like abortion care, doctors and scientists have no need for politicians like Greg Abbott to insert themselves where they do not belong. I'm so incredibly proud of the Texas families who are fighting back. It's brave enough to support your kid who probably turned out a lot different than you expected and who probably brings a lot of heat on you and your family for not conforming. To not only do that, to not only support them, but to then step up and say, fuck Greg Abbott, fuck the prospect of fines and jail time and CPS investigations. I'm going to love my kid the way that they deserve to be loved. Like, it just makes my heart really full. Um, Sorry. So if you would like to support these families um, and these teens, you can donate now to Lambda Legal, which is not only fighting for transgender lives in Texas, but also across the country. Um, I have ads on this video, and I'll be donating 100% of the ad revenue to Equality Texas, uh, which is a nonprofit that fights for the rights of LGBTQI people across the state via political action. Um, Sorry (laughs) for tearing up, Um, but thank you for watching, and please stay safe out there.